We carry on after defeating Charlotte for the 11th badge, now equipped with Dive to try to reach Amatrine City. Before we leave though, a couple things. Go back to see your friends in the same apartment building, and you'll see that Hardy has joined them. Talking to him will give you a relationship point, as he comments on the crazy women in Calcinon, meaning the Belrose sisters. Noel, after throwing his sister into that mix too, tells you to watch out for the effects of a field we may encounter soon, underwater. Though that seems like it's prefacing another field effect description pretty soon, we're actually not going to talk about it today, mostly because it's actually entirely reasonable not to even encounter a Pokemon underwater where we're going. Also, have you seen the video length? We can fit underwater in a later episode. Before we leave town, let's take a look at the news. The first story from the same Pokemon as always is that a new anonymous tip has been received, saying that there is yet one more base belonging to Team Meteor somewhere in Reborn City, where despair will strike again. Next channel. Gardevoir now interviews a person we haven't heard from in a very long time, Florinia. The grass gym leader verbosely discusses how the Onyx Ward school was cannibalized to be a reborn gym before she became the principal and leader and she got the building to be both school and gym. But Florinia makes it clear that this was done neither with passion nor as an act of enjoyment. She simply did it as a means to further education, completely bereft of emotional value. Florinia says that emotion is something she wishes not to employ for fear of further pain to which Gardevoir surmises correctly that someone hurt Florinia. Though she admits it is true, she states that nothing more will be discussed about that. Moving on to Arclight's show, he... Actually, let's skip that for today. For now. Okay, it's time to leave the city, but not by the east exit. You should instead definitely go to the southern guard shack where the stairs were blown up last episode. You should definitely not go all the way to the east through Route 4, the LCC Meteor Base, all of the caves in Route 3 to then go all the way back to Calcinon to then capture this footage. No sir, don't do that. Walk inside and talk to the guard, who says like before that the road is closed, before going on to say that maybe something could be done to quickly fix the stairs. However, he puts a price point on such a task at $40,000. Okay, sure. The guard is amazed at our generosity, and he sets a crew to work. They then rebuild a stone-hewn staircase in 20 seconds. Okay, sure. With this, we now have a shortcut that skips everything we traveled through in the last episode that I described. And with the ladder down to Route 2 I mentioned before, we can go between Agate Circus and Calcinon with ease. By the way, I want to bring up a point about money. You may think that $275,000 is a boatload of money and that I should have no financial issues for the rest of the game. Perish the thought keep pinching. Now we can use the brand new oil drum staircase. If you were to walk to the right, then you'll discover there's another smaller staircase leading to a cave. Inside is a cache of three items. An electorizer, a magmarizer, and a ghost memory. Speaking of those first two items, you may remember Pokemon in Calcinon that are related to those items. Return to the school being heated by a magby. When you speak to the teacher, she will inquire about that fresh magmarizer, and when we agree to give it to her as a replacement heater, the magby gets excited and wants to join us. It knows we can hook it up. Let's save scum once and obtain this magby with four 31 EVs. Other than special defense, this is a full IV special attack magmortar potentially. Similarly, let's return to the house with the Elekid and his Taskmaster owner. When the dick catches sight of our Electorizer, he says it would be so much more powerful and quiet than the stupid Elekid. When we give it to him, he orders us to get the Elekid out of his sight. Come on Elekid, you deserve better than this. Oops, I reset on a 31 attack IV Elekid because I wanted 31 special attack. That sure was dumb. Hopefully the game doesn't reward me on the very next attempt with a shiny Elekid! Yes, I will take that one. It got the 31 attack IV anyway. Okay, now it's time to leave Calcinon. We're not going to Amatrine Mountain yet though. With our new stairs and ladder access all the way back to the circus, let's go poke around and see if anything falls out. Turns out something will. The worker by the alleged Ferris wheel will explain the reason why the Ferris wheel is out of commission. Terra. Could have seen that coming. What you may not see coming is the fighting memory he gives us. Sweet. If you head back to talk with Samson and Ciel, the former will tell you how their loudest trio member has been absent for some time. 
The latter, meanwhile, will tell you something about Terra and her badge, kind of out of nowhere. You may remember how a certain steel gym leader told us to figure it out. Figuring it out requires Waterfall. But even if we get Waterfall, we'd need Terra's badge to use it. Seems like I missed a point of dialogue somewhere, but trust me. There's way more dialogue I missed in this game. But the number of times you'd have to play the game to see them all would be... Actually, forget all of this. Oh, but now? It's time for something critically important. Go back to see your best enemy Indra again. Battle him, and notice something. The levels and compositions of his teams have all suddenly improved. You know why? Because he now awards you 5 XL Candies! It's time you know what the XL Candy does. It gives a Pokémon 30,000 experience points. Let the grinding officially begin. I battle Indra until I have 100 of these. Yes, no joke. After beating on the clown for an hour, I then turn around and notice someone I haven't seen before. Turns out, I spoke incorrectly about something, like always. The tile puzzle comes back for one more gasping breath. In its maybe final iteration, I don't know, I can't remember everything from 500 previous hours of playing Reborn, it looks like a form of tile puzzle I'm actually pretty familiar with. A 15 tile slider puzzle. The way this works is that you must essentially move around the one empty space around the grid instead of the pieces, such that the 15 pieces form the picture. Now, it doesn't work exactly the same, but this is the same kind of tile puzzle as the secret one you can find in Final Fantasy 1, which you get by pressing the A and B buttons at the same time about 50 times on the NES controller to activate the puzzle while on a boat, in case you were wondering. No one was. This is why I know about this brand of tile puzzle because I played this in a failed Final Fantasy 1 low-level challenge because it gives money. So I did it 160 times. Please excuse the tangent. This is literally the only place in time I will ever get to mention I did any of that, all for it to go to waste on the same hard drive that had my first file of Pokémon Reborn. You know what's the spookiest part of it too? That first file of Reborn reached where we're going to be at the end of this episode. Anyway, the trick to this puzzle is to group together rows of pieces into a line. Start with the top row, and tunnel through every other piece until they all gravitate to the top. Then shift them into place. Repeat with the second and third rows. Try to get the pieces of a single row into L shapes to have them curl around other pieces. It makes more sense when you play it. When you get to the last row, if you haven't already solved it, disturb your third row to shove any of the tiles out of place up into it, then move it so that they can drop it between or around the other two tiles on the bottom. The third row pieces should stay together in pairs on either side, so that when you drop the fourth row tiles all down, the third row comes back in correctly. Put it all together, and you will win a Turtwig. With that, we've exhausted all new content in old areas. It's time to find new content in new areas by heading back to Amatrine Mountain. First, we're leaving the story progression alone like always and going down to this dive point. Welcome to Underwater with the underwater theme, Glitchek City's remix of the dive theme from Ruby and Sapphire. This is another of those super chill tracks that is going to stick with you all the way throughout the rest of the game. Now head directly right, and you eventually discover a green item ball, meaning a field effect readout. Well, obviously, the field effect readout you find underwater is the readout for Snowy Mountain. Obviously. Don't worry, I'll talk about it soon. Now head north and curl around this rock wall to find another dive opening. When you come up for air here, you'll find yet another example of the last water HM barrier to the north that we can't traverse. The rest of this room is a dead end, except for another item ball. A gray one. Want to know what it is? You'll see in a few minutes. There's only one more dive spot in Celestinine Mountain. The one right here. When you go through the canal below the surface, which you should remember to item find like all the rest of the dive areas in the game from now on, you'll come out the other side and find this XL candy. Just like the Ultra Balls, I speak about this one to mention that I will stop pointing these out now that Indra is our main candy dealer. Last in this area is the TM for Dragon Tail. Stop procrastinating. It's time to venture into a new area and see what monstrous things await us. Return to Amatrine Mountain to the Ice Pyramid and head to the dive spot to the north. 
After a simple swim to the left in water inside of a frozen mountain, god, how the hell do we not freeze to death? We surface over here on this side of the iceberg, but it still blocks our path. Head south another couple screen lengths to find one more area of deep water. Swim through the rock door and rise up to the light to see the awful truth. You should see the telltale lights on the bottom of the machine and know already what you face. It is a pulse. When you get out of the water to investigate, you may not quite recognize what Pokemon has grown uncontrollably out of that machine. In that case, let me crack open the new Pulse Dex entry we just obtained. It is an Avalug. And this Avalug is... THICK. A single type Pokemon with solid rock and defenses like that? Holy shit, breaking down the walls outside might take less time. When we approach the monstrously deformed Pokemon, it wails in agony. There's no getting around this. Figuratively and literally. So now we will commit an act of mercy and end the miserable Avalug. But the creature isn't going to make that easy. What's a bit unusual in my opinion is what level the Avalug is. 70. It's five levels weaker than the last pulse we faced and is even outleveled by some of my Pokemon. However, the stats this thing possesses are ludicrous, surely making up for a few measly levels. It also might be accurate in-universe. After all, if you remember back to Mosswater Factory all the way back in Episode 1, Pulse Zero 2, this one, was considered terminated, so it's understandable that its power fell behind. Now, what are we going to do against it? Well, the one advantage we have over it is that we are going to be faster than it, no matter what. I test the waters with Fake Out, which gives an unnecessary speed boost on Icy Field, but then we learn the real reason Avalog is going to be a problem. Leftovers. Yeah, with those stats. That really puts the UG in Avalog. I decide to put up a light screen to help, but then it used Avalanche, which is only boosted by the field and not getting its own boost it still puts Meowstic into red. I bring out Houndoom and shoot a gout of fire at the iceberg, but even if it weren't nerfed by the ice field, it would still be underwhelming. Avalog replies with Earthquake, which kills Houndoom and puts a free spikes on the field for him. I'm not very confident right now. Heracross is next against the mountainous Pokemon, and she decides she is going to punch it a lot and kick it once. Close combat does leave a fairly large dent in the ice, but Avalanche at full strength easily entombs Heracross. Mawile is next and Iron Heads, which at the time I was hoping would cause a flinch, but I realize that sheer force removes that chance. The attack itself is not better than close combat, and Mawile is also quaked, setting down more ice stalagmites. A little late, I send in an underleveled Zeb to paralyze Avalug, which happens, but even without a strengthened Avalanche, Zeb is buried. That just leaves my Talon Flame. This isn't going to work. Not unless I get Paralysis Prox a shitload of... <laughs> Got me going for a second. Well, let's turn on that reset counter that's missing once again and try harder. This time I start right up with Thunder Wave, but Zeb can't survive Avalanche even with 30 more HP. Mawile chips a piece off the mountain and dies to an Earthquake. I bring Heracross out again and beg the game to give me a Paralysis Turn Steal, but it doesn't do it, as Heracross is flattened again. The creature is halfway dead, but so is my team. Houndoom is next, and though it would be a simple matter to say Destiny Bond be gone, I don't want to yet. I know this is possible without it. I try Foul Play, since Flamethrower is weakened, which does decent damage, and then Avalug fails to act. Great, let's try Flamethrower to compare. It definitely seemed weaker, but with great fortune, Avalog can't bother to Earthquake Houndoom yet again. However, its leftovers is doing him a... Solid. Solid. Solid rock. You get it? You get it. Foul play may have been able to kill without the damn leftovers making everything worse, as the mountain easily crushes Houndoom this turn. But now Avalog is so low, I know that Talonflame can come in and finish it off with a Brave Bird, with a crit for good measure. In the grand scheme of Meteor, Avalog does rank quite low in terms of difficulty for the Pulse fights, maybe even the lowest except for perhaps Tangrowth 1 and apparently Abra. 
that being said, I did lose to it once, so it's a sign that the game is going to favor these monstrosities more as time goes on. Oh, and let me make something clear. This pulse Avalug was not one of the four pulses Meteor was said to be operating currently. Just like some of the previous pulse encounters, the defeat of the progenitor of the unnatural formation here in Amatrine causes the entire ice pyramid to instantly dissipate. To greet us right away is Shelly, who both witnesses a pulse machine for the first time and instantly shit-talks Meteor's plan of setting the Avalog here in the middle of a wide open cavern in an effort to block off a path. The fact you thought of an improvement to their plan is mildly scary, Shelly. Anyway, she says she is going to Amatrine 2 to find Heather and has brought the ruby ring with her. That thing is bouncing around everywhere. She tells us she'll see us there and hikes off. We begin to make the trek too, which involves a few ice sliding puzzles. The first one can be solved by walking up the left side of the ice as high as you can go before sliding right, then moving up one tile to slide into this rock. Then you simply go up, left, down, right, and up to the ladder. The other ice puzzle is just a few moves as well, starting from the higher tile next to the ice to go left all the way to the water, then down, right, up, right, down, right, up, right. With that, we exit Amatrine Mountain and reach the city of the same name. And when you step out into the open air of Amatrine City, your ears are then introduced to another of the best tracks in the game. Glitchek City's remix of Snowbell City from X and Y. Ame knew how to pick a track for a place in the game, as well as creating this remarkable sensation of climbing ever higher, not just physically up these mountains, but through this game. You can't help but feel your journey's progression in the music. Forever higher you must climb, but this powerful partner in your ears gives you all that you need. At the same time, this new area yields a new field effect, which should be pretty obvious considering the landscape. So let's get into battle to show off the field effect, Shiny Ambipom. Shiny Ambipom? Again, I'm trying to do something entirely unrelated like with the Pukumuku. And a Shiny steals my thunder. As I catch the orange monkey, let me fill in the effect galaxy map with Snowy Mountain. Snowy Mountain, another field effect named after the landscape. Obviously, this effect is related to Mountain, which could become snowy using Blizzard, Glaciate, Sub-Zero Slammer, <laughs> or if Hail was active for three turns without the field changing in between. Snowy Mountain is really a ramping up of Mountain, buffing a lot of the same types while buffing or debuffing others. Let's go over the changes. Like its temperate counterpart, flying and rock moves gain 50% power, but this time, rock moves gain an ice secondary typing. Ice moves will enjoy a 50% power boost, while fire moves will get a 50% power cut. Ice Pokemon also enjoy half again as much defense when it is hailing, similar to Desert's effect on ground types. Speaking of hail, it and harsh sunlight will last for 8 turns. Refrigerate gets a 30% bigger boost for its moves, and these three abilities are activated. Gale Wings, once again, is activated when the winds turn strong, and long reach boosts damage by 50%. Now for move changes. Starting with Icy Wind, its power is doubled to 110. These moves meanwhile get a 50% boost. The same ones from Mountain, but now the Ice type moves have the other 50% boost. Like on the Unsnowy Mountain, these same moves get 50% more power during strong winds. And yes, Gust receives the boost twice. What's crazy is that Icy Wind is here too meaning now its power is 165. Not everything is buffed though. Scald and Steam Eruption lose half of their power. Like Snowless Mountain, Thunder never misses, and Tailwind lasts for 6 turns and generates strong winds for the same time. Aurora Veil can be used without hail. Nature Power becomes Avalanche. Camo is Ice. Secret Power may freeze. 
A Telluric Seed will increase special attack by two stages and lower accuracy by one. Lastly, if you want to melt the snow and make this a dry mountain, use one of these moves. Or if you want no mountain at all, use Splintered Storm Shards. I love the idea that everyone is living on this mountain and then the entire mountain shatters and everyone falls to their death. Just because your Lycanroc is a maniac. So that's the makeup of Snowy Mountain, which shows that it's a lot more to take in than its iceless form. Many more types are affected while maintaining many of the same quirks. Several moves get even stronger than they were before, and some nasty ice type shenanigans can take place here. Oh, believe me, they will fucking take place here. Ice types definitely don't have the defensive fragility like they usually do on this field, and flying types continue to shine. Something to keep in mind is the rock type change adding an ice secondary. That means that rock is now quad effective to flying, while neutral to ice. This can really trip you up, so keep it in mind if you're using rock moves. Depth, 6. Difficulty, 7. Walk the rest of the way into town to quickly find the bug gym leader surveying the area. She suggests we split up and look for clues by talking to everyone in town, then meeting up at a suspicious looking place. Okay, I'm sure we'll know it when we see it. Once she goes off, walk into the first house to the north and talk to the old man inside. He talks about the harshness of nature, like the outside majestically demonstrates, and says that though humans persevere through it, not all can. He then makes a mention of a Pokemon still out there. We'll see what he means in a little bit. Now let's leave- No. No. Have to get out. Can't run from it forever. Not long now. Head west and talk to this girl who says that, normally, an impassable trail off the mountain isn't so bad for them in terms of food, but this time, they soon discovered that all of their emergency food had also disappeared. Holy shit, that's a brutal situation. A lot of doors here are either locked or have nothing to do inside. This house appears the same, except the computer, despite reading out code upon examining it, is not evil and heinous this time. This is actually where you can modify the form of Rotom. Hopefully you got the Rotom from Shade's gym before leaving Reborn City. Head north and find only one more open door and a girl blocking the way. Just as you near her though, the Q line and Pokemon cry tell you a Lucario is nearby. Atop the building in fact. It flees to the east. We'll follow it in a moment. If you talk to the girl, She'll tell you to please not continue in this direction, as she is looking through the snow here for her dropped necklace. So instead, we'll head back the way we came, after checking out this apartment building. Two of the three NPCs in this building only world build Amatrine City for you, while the youngest child compliments your Pokémon. Too bad it isn't Pidov, he says. He says he wants one so bad, but there are none in the mountains. No problem, little guy, here's one. For trading our Pidov away, he excitedly gives us the final remaining fossil, Old Amber. Big find for when we can finally return to Spinal Town. As for the boy, he can't wait to train and evolve his Pidov into a Star Raptor. Well, that will be an important lesson. Before we head to the south end of the city down the hill, let's go to the east and around this narrow path. By doing so, we spy the Lucario we saw earlier but now with an egg. When we make ourselves known, it roars and jabs at us as it runs off with the egg. We can't follow it until we do more in the plot. Head down this hill now to find this ice rink with several people standing around having fun. One of them though, tells us how their current crisis isn't over, but as long as their guardian angel helps them, it'll be okay. Who is it? She can't say, neither will this man who says this person is delivering food to them, as this boy says they are doing so secretively. Why? On the other side of the skating rink, another child will mention something else. The peak of the mountain used to be the site of gym battles, but the ice gym leader here retired. The boy says he still lives here, and is named... the same last name as Cal. Step outside the rink to talk to this lady, who lets slip that the angel helping them is a girl and that if her identity is revealed, she won't be able to help them anymore. While nearly everyone is preoccupied with the Guardian Angel, 
This boy is interested in something else. The haunted house. He says the gray house up above is haunted after an accident left two girls who live there dead. You wanna bet Shelly will pick that place to meet up? Let's leave it for last then, and instead jump back onto the ice. Use the immovable kids as sliding stones to reach this single outlet to the south. Walk down the secret path to reach the TM for Snarl. To the west is the aforementioned haunted house, as well as a shop, but nothing of note. To the right are two buildings, one of them a Pokemon Center, and the other what looks like a gaming cafe. But you see, this isn't a gaming cafe. It's actually an opening to hell. Talk to the man at the PC on the right, who says he is the sysadmin of this network, but something terrible has happened. A virus has infected his network, and he is not strong enough to defeat it. What does he mean? Stare into the computer screen and bear witness to pure, pixelated evil. No. Do not adjust your display. You are screwed. This is it. The Killing Field Glitch Field. By far, without a doubt, the worst field in the entire game. There is not a single time in this game that I was happy to fight on Glitch. Every time you come here, all of your strategy that you cultivate painstakingly to overcome an already too wide array of challenges goes right to shit. What's wrong with Glitchfield? Everything that was wrong with Gen 1. Nearly everything that has changed since Pokemon Red and Blue comes back to make its home in Reborn on this field. Let's be more specific. Look at this type chart. See those three attack types? Those are normal type. Know the physical special split? It's gone now. No special attack and special defense? They're one stat now. Whichever is higher. Yeah, that all sounds familiar, doesn't it? Here's what else changes. Psychic moves get a 20% damage boost. Just because. The critical hit ratio of a Pokemon is boosted by one stage if its speed stat is higher than the target, trying to mimic the crit ratio being tied to base speed. The type chart actually is this now. In case that doesn't make sense, Bug and Poison are both super effective against each other. Ice hits fire neutrally. Dragon moves hit fairy, steel, and even itself neutrally. Ghost moves don't affect psychic types. Explosion and self-destruct will have the target's defense when calculating damage. Recharge moves like Hyper Beam don't need to recharge if you KO a target. Fuck that one in particular. Blizzard's accuracy is 90% from 70. Rage locks the user into it indefinitely. Metronome never selects a move with less than 70 base power. Nature Power becomes Metronome. Secret Power may lower speed by one stage. Camouflage is... Um... If you have a Silvally, it becomes... Uh, using a synth seed raises defense by one stage and the user becomes, uh, yeah, specifically it becomes a uh, type. More accurately, a glitch type, a la missing no. That means it has no type matchups. Let me reiterate, a Pokemon that becomes this type now can't be hit super effective by anything. That sounds a might bit problematic, don't you think? Like it could be broken in a multitude of ways and leave you with some of the worst situations imaginable? But, for now, let's not worry about that. Let's just talk about the moment-to-moment -moment suffering you will feel on this godforsaken computer hell. Let's start with a positive. At least it doesn't replicate the 1 in 256 glitch. That's it, that's your one positive. Psychic is a problem now. Because as you might remember me saying, Ghost doesn't work on it anymore. Dark type is normal type. You have one answer to psychic. Bug. Good lord you'd better have some bug types available. The special stat is something that, of course, wholly depends on the Pokemon you're using. 
it mostly makes anything that was a crazy special sweeper glass cannon an absolute monster to remove, like Alakazam. Of course, the last thing to talk about is the physical special split and its removal here. Recall from your distant past when you played Gens 1 to 3 and remember that fire is always special, ghost is always physical, dragon is always special, and so on. The physical special unsplit, combined with the removal of three types and other minor changes, leaves you with something that, on its own, you could maybe plan for. It would be awful, as you'd have to make sure that your Pokémon only use move types that correspond to their better stats, and that they aren't Fairy, Dark, or Steel moves. And therein lies the rub. You aren't afforded the opportunity to fight these battles in isolation. They'll be mixed in with battles that operate under the rules the rest of the game uses. In those times when you must fight on Glitchfield alongside anything else, your regular team will be hobbled, and in Reborn, that isn't forgiven. The depth of this field is strange to rank, because it isn't right to compare it to the rest of Pokémon battling in Generation 7. It's literally an entirely different game. As for difficulty, fuck this field. You will never be ready for Glitch, and getting ready is basically impossible. Never mind that it is the site of some of the most heinous battles in the entire game. Depth, why? Difficulty, 10. Now prepare for your first glimpse of hell. Against a team of two? Surely it can't be that bad. Yes. First is a Parasect, to my Meowstic, who I put up front because Psychic OP please nerf. But even the powered up Psychic doesn't knock out the Mushroom Bug, who spores me. It then plants a Leech Seed on me, but Meowstic wakes up in a hurry to blast it again. Now the virus will send out Doug Trio. That's fast, but with low health, it should be easy for Greninja to take care of it with Water Shuriken. Indeed, my ninja takes it out with three stars. So that's it. Easy. What? Yeah, let's do it again. Start with this Weepin' Bell. Well, Meowstic is even better suited here. She takes it out in a fake out in Psychic. After that, Missing Number sends out a Golduck to which I put Vanillux up front since he's the only thing I have that hits water types. But then the Golduck uses Amnesia. Hey, at least it only boosts special defense. Wrong. Remember what I said about the special stats? They're joined together again. Increasing special defense is the same as increasing both. Just like Gen 1 all over again. Freeze Dry now unfortunately does less than half as the awful duck then gets a lucky crit with Hydro Pump. Vanillux hangs on to nearly kill the Golduck, but can't survive the following Psychic. With that little HP left, a Gale Wing's Talonflame can easily take out the Glitch's Golduck. Now we're done. Right? No. You will enter Hell a third time. Against a team of three now. Oh, are your teammates already fainted? Too bad. An alternate Glitch Sprite sends out a Tangela which is able to tank a Psychic and Power Whip for half of Meowstic's HP, but faints after another OP attack. But then comes the scariest Pokémon of this horrible gauntlet by a mile, Jolteon. That thing is going to be unbelievably fast, and it's level 78! I leave in Meowstic on the prayer that it gets to use Light Screen. Jolteon goes first, of course, and hits Discharge, but Meowstic does me proud and lives, setting up Light Screen. Don't have to worry about Thunderfang or something. All of its electric moves will be special attacks. Meowstic faints, but now I have a problem. I have no ground moves either. I go into Houndoom, thinking he has to have the special attack means to take down the Jolteon fast. But speaking of fast, Jolteon is still quicker than Houndoom and goes around the light screen with Body Slam. Annoyingly, it paralyzes, but Houndoom ignores it to scorch the Jolteon for half its HP. It then slams a second time, which Houndoom can live, but he must not lose his turn if he wants to kill. He gets it. This leaves the computer's last file. Pidgeot. Damn it! No ice, no electric, what is wrong with my coverage? I keep Houndoom out there in the hope he can somehow get a Destiny Bond off, but that doesn't happen. That's when Glitchfield gets to smile with vicious murder in its eyes again. 
Pidgeot kills Houndoom with Hyper Beam. Oh no. That's Gen 1 Hyper Beam, which means it doesn't need to recharge since it killed Houndoom. This is really bad. I need to make sure I go first, and that will be a job for Talonflame. I go all in on Brave Bird, which does over half, as Pidgeot decides to use Tailwind, meaning I can't outspeed it now. I'm thinking it'll use Hyper Beam again, but instead, it gets the luck to land a Hurricane. Flying-type Blizzard hits Talonflame, but he comes out alive, and Brave Bird's the last of his own HP away to take out the Pidgeot and shut down the virus at last. Now get this demented hellscape out of my face. For expunging the virus from his system, the admin awards us with yet another currently unhelpful department store sticker. With this, the entire city is explored, except for one building. The haunted one, of course. Head inside, and you'll find out fast that, while haunted may not be accurate, something terrible did happen here. Nothing good can come from a pulse machine being here. On cue, Shelly arrives to this dreadful place as we walk over to the inactive pulse. She says she heard the same story, that two girls died here. She rationalizes that it is probably good we're here. Maybe we can learn something important. Upon looking around, Shelly spots something and hands it to us right away. Another of the Agate Circus battle passes. This one called Gravity. Uh-oh. Back to the circus again? Shelly continues by opening up one of the books nearby, stating that it looks like a diary. Well, since the house is abandoned, she says, it's probably okay to read this. No one has ever really gotten in trouble for reading a diary, she says. You want to find Waterfall, Shelly? She begins to read, saying the diary apparently belonged to a person named Lumina Sejaya. It starts by saying that the writer's mother has gotten sick, the same way as her father did. Within another entry, the girl writes that both of her parents are gone now, and she only has her sister Evelyn left. Bad news continues to visit this writer, who tells in her next entry that she has gotten the same sickness as her mother and father. Even though she has some years left, she's scared, and her sister will not accept this. Evelyn begins working herself to the bone to find a cure for the disease, much to the worry of the writing girl. She goes on to detail how her sister ended up building a device capable of enhancing a Pokemon's healing powers. The girl's spirits are high, believing she may be able to live for a long time. As if it wasn't obvious, the next entries show this is not how things went. Soon after the machine is built, Lumina writes that a man dressed in black came to the house asking about it. He wanted it to use for his organization. When Evelyn tried to refuse, Lumina got within the reach of the man, who then took her hostage and threatened Evelyn into serving his interests. Then comes the final entry, which Shelley mentions has wildly different handwriting. Lumina describes what accident took place here, having to do with Eve's machine. She apparently was going to test her machine with a magneton, when right in the middle of the test, it evolved. When a magneton evolves, Lumi explains, the three pieces fused together into one. When it did so inside of this machine, that effect suddenly radiated outward into the three humans in the room. When next she could see, Lumi says that she saw herself as if in a mirror and heard the voice of Eve and the man without end. Eve's voice, stuck within her head, explained the ghastly truth. The accident had fused the three human consciousnesses together into one body. Lumi ends by saying she doesn't know what will happen to her and her sister's bodies that remain, but she got her wish. She won't die as soon now, and she won't be alone. Ever. Again. And that's when... Mm, that dude who showed up when we beat the bear tick in episode 5 now suddenly shows up here asking what we're doing in here. Shelly jumps at his appearance, then asks him if he's seen a girl around her height with pink hair. The guy claims he hasn't, then identifies Shelly as the Lapis Gym Leader. She's sheepish to find out he knows her, but when she inquires who he is, making a mention about looking like somebody, he introduces himself as Nunya, Nunya Business. Then he tells us to get out of this building and leaves. What an asshole! 
oil drum rights, cutting out a lot of other swear words. Shelly tells us that the way that guy acted is the same as everyone else whenever she asked about Heather. They would just cut off the conversation. That's when she realizes how we can learn more about what's going on, and leaves the sight of the first pulse machine. One mystery solved. Do you feel better knowing? Or wonder if ignorance really is bliss? When you go back outside, you'll see Shelly down the ledge talking to the haunted house kid. Shelly asks not who the guardian angel is, but what would happen if her identity was revealed. The child says it would probably mean they'd get no more food from her, but not because the angel would be mad, it would be because the person looking after her would be mad. When Shelly asks what his name is, the child sees no reason to hold back. His name is... Well, he looks just like the douchebag who just threw us out of even Lumi's former house. Shelly has become certain that Heather was, quote unquote, being cared for by this guy. Shelly asks where we can find him since no one knows where Heather has been in a few days, as the child decides to open the door to the apartment where he's at. Head up the hill and find the closest apartment is now open. Go into the elevator to the top floor, walk inside, and meet... Okay, his name is Blake. His name is fucking Blake. Please welcome Blake, the only person in this game who has a shot at taking the title of Ultimate Asshole from Fern. Yeah, in case it hasn't been obvious, I hate Blake vehemently. And not necessarily for the same reasons as Fern. He's like a caricature of a big giant douchebag bro. Some of his dialogue makes him so face-punchable. But let's just go back a bit. Shelly finally gets the bastard's attention from his call of duty and demands he tell us where Heather is. But he quickly makes it clear what he wants. The ruby ring. Yeah, he's also a fucking meteor on top of everything, so he's totally in on terrorism and murder. Shelly hesitates, not because of the ring's purpose, but because it's important to Heather. Blake decides he'll sweeten the deal, revealing he knows who I am too, and offers the TMX for Waterfall. What? From this fuck? Then you are actually given the choice. Give away the ring and get Waterfall and info about Heather? So, here's the thing. If you say yes, you do get the machine. Getting that out of the way. But you should think about what Charlotte said. Acquiescing the Meteor's demands will validate their behaviors, while refusing gets them no closer to their goal. It may seem cruel to do, but I say no. Shelly is upset by this, and begs us to reconsider. Again, I refuse to go along with Dickhead over there. Blake begins getting impatient, as Shelly pleads for us to reconsider. She says we'll figure it out another way. Once more, sorry Shelly, but I refuse to give Blake the ruby ring. But at that, Blake realizes that Shelly meant we could give it to him right now, not that Charlotte still had it. In that case, fucking Blake steals the ring from Shelly. He gets ready to fly the coop as Shelly yells after him about Heather. That's off, Blake says, but he tells her that he does have Heather locked up. He ended up finding out that she was the one passing out food. The emergency rations Meteor ordered him to steal. The reason he did that? To cleanse the world by cleansing the people of Amitrine right out of it. By the way, he totally washes his hands of the zealotry stuff. He just wants to be at the top of the world at the end. Oh yeah, no worries, I totally already know one fuck up like you. Afterwards, he says a lot of other shitty dumb expressions in a row and bails, leaving us with no trail to Heather. And no, he did not give us Waterfall either. The game really does diverge a progression crucial item like this. Shelly isn't giving up though. With no other leads, she decides we should go back outside to try to learn more from the citizens. As soon as we go back out into the cold, Shelly begins to wonder aloud where Blake could have hidden Heather as a guy with blue hair passes by. That blue-haired guy recognizes Shelly, who jumps and thinks that he is Blake. He's not Blake. He's Cal. I was totally going to do the Radimus joke again. Shelly is scared of Cal, though, after what happened last they were together, and starts to leave. Cal implores her to listen, and apologizes for what he did. He tells her not to excuse his actions, and says he doesn't expect forgiveness. Instead, he wants to fix the future, and asks if she would help him. She says okay, but has a question. Why is his hair blue now? 
He's a bit taken aback by this, but says it is actually what his natural hair color is supposed to be. All right, Millhouse. He explains the reason it was red before was because everything he did before was meant to be a way to one-up his brother, dyeing his hair the opposite color, joining the Reborn League as the opposite type, and joining Team Meteor. Oops, forgot to tell Shelly that one, but now, as opposed to when we last saw Cal, he's actually trying to fight against Meteor instead of sitting back. In that case, we get Cal up to speed about Heather as he loops us in on the breadth of the issue. Meteor is sending an air unit to Amatrine to pick up Blake. Shelly realizes Meteor will get the ring in that case, so we must stop them and find Heather at the same time. Heather, who, as Cal recalls from Shelly telling him, is a member of the Elite Four, by the way. What? Not once has that been stated, as far as I'm aware. It will make you wonder, why the hell can an Elite Four be handled by everybody? From Lynn, to Sigmund, to Blake. Anyway, in case you want a reason she's in the Elite Four, Shelly says it's because her mother was as well, and she apparently took after her strength. Cal thinks her strength will come in handy now, as her Salamence will let her rip apart the air unit and we can chase Blake. After we get the ring, Cal says, he will take out Solaris. Whoa, that kind of a tall order for you, Cal? But now comes the problem. We still don't know where to find Heather. Cal does. He says that there's a secret passage in Blake's apartment. We'll need to figure out the security as he tries to slow down Blake. We break and head back into the apartment. Now comes a quick code puzzle. All of Blake's apartment becomes interactive, and we need to assemble clues to understand the nature of the puzzle itself. The bookshelf by Shelly, and Shelly herself, will yield no clues, but the game system nearby pops out a program disc. A head of a key is in the trash bin. A cabinet nearby looks like it could fit that key if completed. The left sofa has three coins. The potted plant next to it has a number on it. Four. Across the room is another plant, with the number one on it. The tree directly south says six. On the table, the book has a note that says green, with a series of stars and compass directions. The gray box is the missing food for the city, but it doesn't help in our puzzle. The bookshelf behind it yields a piece of paper that has a number five, followed by six stars. The dresser has the rest of the key. The book beside it tells us another code fragment. Eight is the third digit. The fourth plant next to the bed reads three. Under the bed is, um, inappropriate material. Behind us is a computer, but it appears to be powered off. We've exhausted all the interactive elements that matter, but we assembled the key to the cabinet. Inside of that cabinet is a power cable. We bring the cable to the computer to power it on, and then it requests a program disk. Insert the disk we got, and we are presented with a code prompt of seven digits. We have the first and third digits, and if you look at the note with compass directions again, you'll notice that in those directions are the four plants we found numbers on. This sets the last four digits as 3164. But where's the last digit? We could just code break it, but talk to Shelly again, who will show us she found the last digit, zero. Put in that code, 508 and voila, a passage appears. Shelly goes through first, and we follow into a separate section of Amatrine Mountain. The path up is completely linear, and leads us outside to a ledge on the mountain. When we walk to the right, we discover Shelly in what is surely Heather's prison. Shelly calls out to Heather, but then remembers. Last time we saw Heather, she was not on speaking terms. Period. But when we go omniscient to see inside the small cell, we find that it is indeed Heather who's here. It appears that after all this time, Heather has found her voice again, which she uses to verbally lash out at everyone. She can't stand being alone anymore, hating her father and Blake for their betrayals. But then she realizes she bears the blames for being the one who ran away all the time. This is what she wanted, but now that she has it, she's sorry. Upon uttering those words, she hears a voice at the door. Of course, it's Shelly's voice, who is overjoyed when Heather speaks to her. The two then plan to get the door completely off the cell. Whereas Heather couldn't do it alone with her Salamence, bullshit, you couldn't. Together, Salamence and Heather, sorry, and Mega, 
tear the door clean off the shed. The two then share a heartwarming reunion as Shelly tells Heather that we need her help. Blake has her ring. That's all she needs to know. Time to kill Blake. Yeah, I'm completely on board. Shelly asks if we will head to where Cal went to chase Blake as Heather and her ride to take down the air unit. She says we'll meet up on the peak. The two fly off, leaving you to peek inside this shed. Seems Heather doesn't know what a Silvoli is, as its flying memory is here. Now head all the way back to Amatrine City. We have to head left to advance the story, but that was where the girl who dropped the necklace previously blocked us. So first, go into this house that was empty and find that girl here. She says she never did find the necklace, and is sad that she doesn't have something to use for this pretty big stone she has. But that's when she catches sight of the other floral charm we've had in our pocket for like 58 hours. She asks if we would part with it, and when we do, she is joyful, and gives us the stone she had, which was a banatite. Gladly. Now we begin the chase. Head west of Blake's apartment building and find said douchebag, who apparently has only gone like 50 feet since he left. Cal is already caught up to him, as Blake insults Cal and the teachings he learned at Apophil. Shitty quippy Blake mocks Cal's attempt to hold him up, as two meteor grunts suddenly land beside the brother on our side. Blake says he's Audi, TMI, and we enter battle with Cal against the grunts. Sorry, meteor aces as they are now ranked. Now, the grunt double battles that ensue on the way up the mountain are not that hard, but they are full. However, Cal and I are double full, so most of the time they don't pose a significant challenge. When the grunts are dispatched, Cal tells us that we need to hoof it to the top of the mountain before Blake gets picked up. You'll pick up some items on the way as you bump into Cal again, and battle two more aces. This duo has eight total Pokemon, increasing the pressure but they are dealt with easily enough. When they escape after their defeat, the Telltale Salamence descends in front of us with the Kid Elite Four member. Cal and Heather exchange intros, as Heather reports that the sky is littered with helicopters. Wait, helicopters? Meteor has a fleet of choppers? How? Vehicles in the Pokemon universe just seem strange to begin with for me. Heather says she can't tell which one has their leader as Cal says he's ready to come help with that. He mounts up on his Charizard and takes off with Heather, who tells us that Shelly is up ahead. Reaching her quickly, she tells us we have to catch Blake, as we are ambushed by another pair of flying aces, who drop the pressure back down to six total opponents. We hurry on, facing another pair just a few steps up. This time, they have a total of ten Pokémon, matching the most packed battle we've seen yet. It brings me down to two Pokemon, but Shelly also has some left. Before heading to the left, swing around this small peak here to find a path to the TM for Frost Breath. Interesting utility to have one of the few moves that will always crit. When we head north some more, we'll find Shelly has finally gotten to Blake. But two more grunts arrive to support him as Blake leaves spouting frankly comical slogans, like he's a fucking walking ad. This pair is less stacked than the previous one, but I had to call out this strange occurrence. One of the grunts sends out Agron, who proceeds to use rock moves to quad damage almost all of Shelly's team, while my single Meowstic pretty much shreds the grunt's partner. Somehow, Shelly's entire team was defeated, and yet my first Pokemon, Meowstic, is still standing eight Pokemon later. With the grunts gone, Shelly bravely goes into the cave after Blake. We'll follow her in a second, but we have a side quest to go do. If you had found the Lucario on the east side of Amatrine City before coming up here, then this stone will be gone, and you can make your way over to this small crag. But make sure you save before approaching. As soon as you near the mouth of this cave, the Lucario will emerge in a rage, and we are immediately taken into battle. The Lucario will be a fierce opponent at level 85, matching the current highest level we've seen. This fighting type won't be nearly as bad as the Metacham in Bixbizion, but it is going to knock out a few of your Pokémon. Meowstic manages to tank a Meteor Mash to use Psychic on it for 40% before fainting, as Houndoom comes out next. 
Lucario apparently didn't outspeed normally, as it goes for an extreme speed. Houndoom survives on a quarter of his HP and breathes fire on the Smash Brothers character to defeat her. The pariah seems dismayed, but then thinks for a moment, glancing into the cave. Then, the Lucario seems to recognize our strength and bows to us, then vanishes. In the cave, we find two things. First, a fairy memory, getting closer to having them all. Beside it is the object we saw the Lucario with earlier, an egg. I wonder what is in this egg. It's a Riolu. Big shock. It also has nonsense stats. Four 31s again. Now, we can go back after healing to that cave that Shelly ran into. When we step inside, we'll spot a light shard up above. You might wonder why I said heal before if that's there. That's because there's one more opponent to fight before reaching the peak, who yells our name as we move forward. Following us into the cave is Aster. He gets our attention right away by waving the waterfall HM at us. He then shouts at us to take it from him. Right on the verge of facing a different agent, we instead face Aster. Like so many other times before, the private sends out Soul Rock, and you can feel how alone the Pokemon and Aster are. As usual, Meowstic leads, and her fake out gives her a speed stage. However, I know that Soul Rock's not here to do damage. It'll be using a screen, probably light, so I hit it with Shadow Ball. It doesn't kill it though and it indeed puts up Light Screen, which is bad. Soul Rock itself won't get to make use of it as Meowstic defeats it with another Shadow Ball, but she'll have to give up the speed stage in light of Crocodile arriving next. I switch into Heracross for this since I need to avoid special attacks, something my team has far too many of. Crocodile intimidates Heracross right off the bat, but her close combat is still enough to take out the Croc. Aster, though, is already going to use Lycanroc. I don't have my usual counter to it, Greninja, so instead I try using Mawile, defensively countering its rock type. But when the Lycanroc comes out, we find out this isn't Aster's Midnight. It's Eclipse's Midday. Unfortunately, the Lycanroc can hurt Mawile badly with Drill Run with a Life Orb, but she tanks it. Better still, the Iron Head she sends back knocks a Coyote out ice cold. Aster follows with a Golurk. I have several choices here, but I keep Mawile in to throw one more Sucker Punch. It does not quite half as Golark responds with a Dynamic Punch. If you thought a 50% accurate move landing was unlucky, it has no guard. Fuck. Meanwhile, the damn light screen remains, so I still have to try using physical moves against the ground ghost type. Fortunately, I have a great choice, Houndoom's Foul Play. This easily takes out the Golark only to now be replaced with what is undoubtedly Aster's own Lycanroc. Midnight appears, as I put Meowstic back in to use Fake Out and try to boost my speed over that speedy monster. All of this is annihilated when Midnight pops an Elemental Seed to give himself two stages of speed. My Fake Out is just for tiny chip damage now, and it's about to get worse. Before I hit it with Psychic, it uses Swords Dance. Oh no. When Psychic doesn't kill, I know it's over. I curse that I went in with a special move when Light Screen was still up. Futilely, I send in Zeb to try to paralyze it, but its Stone Edge connects and crushes him. I try to use Houndoom, hoping he'll either miraculously outspeed or survive. He does neither against the Thunder Punch. Heracross cannot survive against Stone Edge, and if you thought Vanillix would survive a Stone Edge, You'd be right, because he is the Clutch Master! Thank you, Icy Field, for putting an Ice type on rock moves! With that, he blasts the dreadful Lycanthrop with Blizzard! And there's one more, past Simeon, who outspeeds and kills Vanillix. Aw, oh, man! But he was so clutch! Well, let me pull my face off the desk, turn on the reset counter, and try again. The battle proceeds exactly the same way on the second attempt for Aster's first three Pokemon, bringing us up to Golurk. This time, I don't want to throw away Mawile in case her Sucker Punch will save us from Midnight, 
so I go directly to Houndoom now. I don't see a lot of other things he'll be doing in this fight, so it's fine if he takes a lot of damage. Never mind. Foul play decks the shit out of Golurk. Thanks for that 124 attack stat. Now we're back to the same Pokemon that shredded us last time, and I try to predict his move. I'm thinking he'll go for Swords Dance first, then rip me up. But if I go second and Destiny Bond, then he won't be able to help himself as he kills me. Unfortunately, the AI doesn't like my idea, and just kills Houndoom now with Stone Edge. This werewolf is so hard to deal with. I try Heracross hoping she'll survive an attack from a clean attack slate. I'll never know though, thanks critical hit! Let's see if I can catch lightning in a bottle twice. In goes Vanillux, but I've forgotten that light screen is still there. Midnight, maybe fortunately, goes for Swords Dance, and my blizzard puts it way down in red. The moment of truth, did Vanillux fluke it? No! He does it again! And a second blizzard whites out the Midnight. This leaves me with a Passimian, and Meowstic is still alive. She goes in to fake out for speed, and easily wipe out Aster's final Pokemon. That fight surely could have gone in a bad direction. But I squeaked by this one, avoiding a horrible slog. That's what the next fucking fight is for. Honorably, Aster confers to us the Waterfall TMX. He doesn't know if that would be what Eclipse would have wanted, but he feels better to do it. Now that he knows he can't beat us, even borrowing Eclipse's power, he knows that if anyone can change the world, it'll be me. With that, he takes off, with the implication that he is resigning from Team Meteor. Find your way, Aster. Now, use the Light Shard and get ready. The next fight is going to make you tear all of your hair out. Also, pick up this PP up on the left. Head up the remaining mountain and find Shelly and Blake once more. When we arrive, we learn that Shelly was not able to beat Blake, who turns to us now. No, Blake. You're pretty really fucking annoying! Now we have to fight this asshole. But let me start at the end for once. This is the team I beat Blake's team with last time. Yeah, it's pretty goddamn ragged looking. But the reason I wanted to show this first is because of what I named this file back then. It is named Blake. Super fuck Blake. Wanna know one reason? Yeah, this fight just shoves you into doubles out of nowhere. He leads with Mamoswine and Gyarados. Just an absolutely crushing wall. My Meowstic and Mawile start off this title fight on Snowy Mountain, with Meowstic getting a competitive boost from Gyarados' Intimidate. I have no idea what's the best way to spend Meowstic's first turn, though. In doubles, Light Screen is so much more powerful, but she may not even go more than once, and maybe I ought to stop one of the two opponents from attacking. In the end, I do go for Light Screen, as Mawile aims her head at Mamoswine. Meowstic does go first to put up the Light Wall, but then Gyarados laughs at me with Waterfall. Then Mamoswine joins in its laughter with an Earthquake. Mawile goes down without even getting a chance to strike. I'm already way behind, but I'm hoping that a 4 times weakness to Electric and Meowstic's up special attack will let me rebound. You think? Watch this. Yeah, Psychic just missed the Mamoswine. Snowy Mountain activates Snow Cloak, and it just ruined the fight. Zeb does rip through the Gyarados with Wild Charge, but in comes another Earthquake, wiping out my whole side. Three Pokemon against five has me checked out already, as I put in Heracross and Houndoom. They'd have to put in a lot of work. And that's when Blake springs his ace on me already. Walrein. Alternate names for Walrein are Endless HP Abyss and Fucker. You can tell I'm out of this fight when I want to use Destiny Bond instead of putting up an actual offense. Mamoswine does an Ice Shard for some reason, as it then gets pummeled by Heracross. Then Walrein bowls her over with Avalanche. This forces me to put in Vanillix, and this is one time I don't want to do that. Blake puts in Alolan Sandslash. Remember what I said about it from Sarah's Gym? It's 10,000 times worse here. My Snow Cone's Hail just boosted Blake's physical defense by 50%. Sounds like a bad choice to bring. All Vanillix can do is use Mirror Shot, 
while Houndoom tries foul play on Sandslash since Flamethrower only amounts to double damage instead of quad in the snow. Vanillix and Sandslash lose half their HP, Walrein loses barely any, and said Walrus stockpiles. Also, want to bring your attention to the fact that Walrein has Ice Body Healing from the Field Effect and Leftovers. Endless HP fucker. I have no idea why I even played out anything here. I get trolled trying for Destiny Bond again when Houndoom isn't killed by Walrein and instead dies to Hail. Fucking Blake. So Vanillux, he's not too helpful right now. So I walk all the way back down the mountain and all the way back up to replace him with Talonflame. That's only half true. I use easy HMs to use Teleport to go back to Amatry. Now we start again, but with Talonflame up front. I reviewed Snowy Mountain again and remembered. Tailwind lasts for six turns up here and starts strong winds, meaning that Talonflame loses his flying base weaknesses. Sounds like a great move to use with Gale Wings. With Meowstic, I decide I do want to halt the Gyarados for a turn, so I fake it out. Tailwind starts, and the Ice Shard that flew at Talonflame does less damage now thanks to the change in type chart for him. I need to hope I don't see the bullshitty Snow Cloak miss this time, as I shoot Psychic at Mamoswine, and Talonflame will acrobatics the Gyarados. Keep in mind, the Strong Winds keep his Gale Wings going. Acrobatics, though, does not inflict the best damage, about the same as Mamoswine's Ice Shard to Meowstic, but her Psychic rolls the Mammoth. Gyarados answers me, though, by Waterfalling Talonflame, taking him out. When I put my Zeb Strika out to zap Gyarados, I'm presented with a much more important target. Starmie. Boy, I hope this Tailwind is good enough to let Zeb outspeed that, while Meowstic will finish off the Gyarados. Zeb does outspeed, and kills with Wild Charge. That was a crucial exchange. We have a strong lead on Blake and a ton of power specifically countering him. But that specificity is reduced when he sends out Weavile, along with Fucker. I know there's no way we're killing both of them this turn. Hell, I'm not sure we can even kill the Walrein with both hits. But that's what I go for. Psychic takes off 40%, and Wild Charge tears down the rest of the Walrus. Thank God! Unfortunately, this lets Weavile take the chance to knock off Meowstic, to which I replace her with Houndoom. Blake sends that Speed Demon Sandslash again, but Tailwind continues to show how insane it is, as Houndoom goes first and completely melts the Sandslash. I feel stupid to have missed that last time. Zeb tries to charge over the Weavile, but falls short and is paid back with another knockoff. But even yet, the Tailwind remains. The fact I outsped an Alolan Sandslash and Weavile is staggering to me. When Mawile comes out, Blake has nothing left to send, so I finish off the Weavile easily. Talonflame continues to blow my mind. I know how good he was from last time, but what he's doing here in earlier parts of the game is incredible. Let's get one thing straight. Blake is what I consider to be one of the first nightmare fights of the game. A fight that seems completely unfair and insurmountable. Snowy Mountain benefits him so much and you are forced to either delete it with a fire move to change it to Mountain, or use it yourself like I did with Talonflame. If you do neither, you'll have a horrible time here. Even my previous team using Camera Up to melt the snow, let me say, it is still a disaster. We've defeated Blake, but he'll have the last laugh. The chopper to pick him up is here as he hastily flees from us. But as you say, Blake, get wrecked, brah. Ugh, oh, I feel sick. Heather and Cal sneak attack Blake from both sides, ripping the ring from him. Blake loses his cool for once as Cal gives the ring to Heather. Blake backs off and prepares to leave, but that's when Shelly yells at him. What about Agate City? Oh yeah! The whole reason for this entire thing was to find the source of the signal over Agate. Turns out, if we believe Blake, that was not something he knew anything about. He quickly closes the helicopter door, and it takes off. Cal lets him go since Solaris never appeared, as Heather thanks us all for our help to her. Heather and Shelly go back to Amatrine to distribute the stolen food before getting back to the fight, as Cal then tells us something. Blake probably isn't lying about not being the culprit behind Agate. He says that, just before he left Meteor, that project was being set up. He doesn't know anything solid beyond that, but the distance from Agate to Amatrine is far too great for such a signal. 
Instead, he says we should suspect who sent us up here in the first place. You remember who that was? It was Terra. As Cal relates, Terra joined Meteor under the code name Tidalwin. So that absolves Titania. As Cal tells us, she's a skilled hacker, though way more obnoxious than their previous one. Yeah, Ace does magic tricks with language. Terra does unspeakable X-rated things with it. But then Cal tells us a strange tidbit. He says that the person who pushed to get Terra into Ace's position, mystifyingly, was Lin. He says that his guess for why Lin favors Terra is as good as ours. No, Cal. My guess is way better. Because it's right. Whoops. Just jumped ahead about episodes. He then suggests we go have a chat with Terra about all of this, before asking Lycan Apophil if we want to ride down the mountain with him. You actually should accept this. It gives you a relationship point. But I'm dumb and stayed up here because, chronologically, I beat Blake before actually finding the Lucario. When you do arrive back in Amatrain City, head to the Pokemart again. The guy in the top right corner of the shop will complain how his efforts to scavenge a heater for parts to sell and call in some food for himself have all been wasted since the emergency food was found. Uh, you okay, buddy? He then shoves the second Magmarizer of the episode into our hands. Sure, I'll take that. We have finished our excursion to Amatrain City. It's time to go pay a clown a visit. Before doing that, though, we should head back to Calcinon real quick. As soon as you enter from the southern gate, You'll see both Kane and Hardy outside. Talking to them gives relationship points with both of them. Kane mentions how we should lay low in Calcinon since Meteor knows I have the ring again. Ha! No, I don't! Hardy says how waiting is not his strong suit, but says who the real victims are right now. Meteor. At least the ones who have to be around Fern. Oh yeah, and dude, there's this other guy, Blake. Man, fuck that guy and fuck you, Fern. To the west are both Sephira and Charlotte. The younger sister is trying to tell her eldest one to get some sleep instead of standing here for yet more untold hours. Charlotte, though, informs us that Laura has disappeared. That's... really, really horrible. Sephira lists in and out of consciousness, but remains steadfast in protecting her family at any cost to herself. Hey, if Charlotte is standing here, that means she's not standing in front of the secret door in her gym. We run in there, and sure enough, the door is clear. Going through and into the cave behind the gym, we enter into a quiet room. On the floor is a megastone. Charizardite X. Awesome. In front of us is a computer, which asks for a username and password. This time, there is no input to make, and no cheating on the solution early. There is one more thing to do in Calcinon, in the house next to the gym. That's the house belonging to Eclipse's father. When we enter, someone else is here. Aster. He and Eclipse's father tell us that she has been brought here, and that her father will try to maintain her body in case she ever wakes up. Aster says he doesn't know what he'll do now, but he's not going to be in our way anymore. He leaves, as the father tells us how he now knows what Eclipse did for him, and with whom. He feels helplessness and regrets. Now, time to pull the curtain back a bit. This scene only occurs if you refuse to give Blake the ruby ring. If you gave it to him, then he'd give you Waterfall, and Aster never shows up in Amatrine at all. In that case, he doesn't come here either. The reward for not giving into Blake's demands are in the next room. Enter and find poor Eclipse, appearing to be asleep but it isn't true. The item in the room with her is the shiny charm. Now, the rate of finding shinies just tripled in this game, where the shiny rate was already just one in 90. Wildly awesome item to get, and it is only available this early if you didn't blink to Blake's demands. Now, we have a clown to beat up, as long as she doesn't get us with that big hammer first. I guess now's a good time to go back to Arclight's rundown. As you could guess, it's for Terra. He mentions that anyone who has met her is probably traumatized. Truer words have never been spoken. But he goes on to detail about Terra's supposed past, that she grew up in Barrel Ward and was a shut-in computer nerd. 
Then next thing you know, she's run away from home and joined a circus as a batshit insane clown. Yeah, totally believable life progression right there. Arclight has no idea why she did this, and also apparently had no idea what her ace is either, or even what field effect she uses. Thanks, Arclight. I guess we'll just have to find out for ourselves. Oh dear god, what comes next? Shiny Luminion! Found it in the middle of training before heading back to Agate Circus. Return to the circus staff room to find Samson, with Ciel following you in soon after. After some comedy between the two opposed type leaders, Ciel notices that we have a battle pass again. The one for Terra. The leader who has apparently gone AWOL for a long time now. They say no one knows where she is, even though there's not a lot of places she could even be. However, though they first rule out Agate, they realize that she had found us there, wondering why she would go there if she said the sleep signal was coming from Amitrine. Yeah, see, about that. We reveal that Terra is in Meteor, which Ciel brushes aside at first. She says there's no way someone that chaotic gets into an organization that has any sort of plan. But before we can say any more, the devil herself appears, to which Samson brings her up to speed that we think she's a traitor. You what, Ms. Seven? That's what she says, verbatim. She lules it off as Ciel then presses her to confirm it isn't true. She forgets what we were talking about. We ask her if she knows what Tidewin is. Some kind of planet from an overly long space movie series? We then ask her directly if she is an agent with Meteor. She answers, Hell yeah! Ciel is shaken by this, as she asks Terra why she joined them. Terra then begins to tell her backstory, where she suddenly harnesses the power of proper grammar, and explains how she was orphaned by a man who murdered her parents, as she took on a persona to start a life-fighting crime. Yeah, this is a comic book plot. I think it used to say Batman directly, but now it's just generic. Tara's deflated about that, but she has another option. Turn to her computer and disappear into it. You fucking what, Ms. Seven? When Samson looks at the screen, he discovers that she basically stored herself in the PC like Pokemon are stored, and it's waiting for player two. He turns to me and says, of course, I have to be the one that follows her. What a surprise. The intercom from the Grand Hall lights up now, as we talk to Ame about the situation. She says that the PC simulates an old video game and begins telling me things I don't want to hear. Yeah, it sounds familiar, Ame. When you're ready to brave whatever the hell this is, talk to Samson, who presses a button, and... Whoa. Just like that. The graphics and music go back 27 years. We are standing in the guardhouse at the beginning of Victory Road from Red and Blue. The guard stops us when we try to pass him, as he says we must have the... Volt Badge to continue. We do have it from Julia, and we can go through. Two more guards ahead ask for badges too. One's from Reborn instead of Kanto. A fourth guard asks us to show the Omen Badge. The Witch of Glitch suddenly appears, smashing the guard into a pile of incorrect floor tiles. She boasts how we'll never catch her, and she flies off, but not before leaving one single ladder tile for us. Going down, we find ourselves in a piece of Mount Moon. Albeit the cartridge is slightly tilted, it will only take you a few steps to encounter a Zubat in Mount Moon giving a feeling of nostalgia, immediately chased by dread. This whole world, or perhaps more accurately, city, is all on glitch field. Muster up more courage somehow, and walk to the bottom right corner of the room to pick up a rare candy. There are two trainers here, and they are skippable. If you were to battle them, you'll find these NPCs aren't quite finished. Their battles are not very threatening, but this is another place where you should avoid fainting. For now, you could backtrack to Agate Circus to heal, but it won't be possible forever. As you come around the corner to the last by the sign, you'll find out this isn't Mount Moon. It's Mount Booty. Yep, this is all Terra's fault. So you battle a couple other half-baked trainers as you walk south to exit Mount Mooney. You may think this place is pretty goofy, and perfectly on brand for Terra, 
What the hell is this? You recognize it, don't you? Shrilly screaming through your speakers with a tortured 8-bit voice. The design, too. Drained of all color, as by a vampire. It's Opal Ward. It is right at this moment that you realize something much worse is happening in this land than you ever realized. This isn't just chaotic happenstance. This is something much more sinister. This is directed, and it is designed to break your mind. It won't be the last time. To be more direct about this scene, this is one of the most chilling moments in the game for me. This 8-bit rendition haunts me, and truly changed Reborn's appeal in my mind. From this point on, I absolutely had to know how this game ended. The Opal Ward of Glitch City is pretty closed off. The stairways are both blocked by bullying NPCs like at the beginning of the game. The way to an 8-bit Parado is blocked by an explosion of wrong tiles. And the most relatable NPC is the one sitting by the staircase down into further madness. Help me. There's no one to help you. Not from this terror, or any of the others soon to come. Descend the stairs to find yourself in Team Rocket's hideout. You'll find that the staircase above the rocket nearby goes down to the same staircase you just came from. The hideout movement tiles are way faster now. At least Terra threw in some quality of life. Talk to Red down here, who seems to be in the middle of a Twitch Plays session, and then pick up this item. That's a light shard. Yeah, kind of unexpected, but it means, like usual, that it is either a pick-me-up or a warning. Get through the rocket hideout and go into the elevator. Every other exit brings you back to the beginning. Coming out the door into Lavender Town, yeah that's about right, you get accosted for the rhyme badge. The uneasiness continues. The NPCs, per usual, are inane and trolly. However, there's a particularly cruel thing to the south. A gravestone. For Eclipse. To exit the creepy pasta. Go through the door marked with the sign saying, Here. But if you thought you'd get away from the Lavender Town music, you know what this is, too. It's Bix Busy in Wasteland. When 23's Lavender Town remix was still being used here, this transition is even more unnerving. Walking through this small patch of moon-like wasteland, you'll find there's very few directions to go. The door to the north is super duper locked, so you must go south down some ledges that you cannot return from. Next in the slideshow of black and white fear is the Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar. Click on the nearby statue to have it scrutinize you for the Millennium Badge. Walk to the bottom right of the mansion where you can fight this trainer who... SHIT! NO! 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 Oh, wait. Sorry. Wrong fan game. Anyway, go down the stairs behind that and reach this room with a notebook and NPC. The NPC tells you that the booty has gone out of control. The notebook says something else. You don't read it. It says that it can see everything from there, thanks to baby Arceus. It will set Arceus free to create a new world to play forever. Did Terra make this? And if not, what the hell is this? So throughout the whole dungeon, Items on the floor have been pretty uninteresting, but that one in the corner? That's a dubious disc. Oh shit yeah! And by the way, if for some reason you didn't get the Porygon from the Onyx Trainer School, not to worry, just jump out the windows by the earlier opponent to end up in the Cite Astra, where every wild encounter here is a shiny Porygon. Take a shiny Porygon with you, then exit to the south only for that childish voice from the Cite Astra to ask you for the Strike Badge. 
you then end up in a place that your save menu will tell you is Victory Road. What kind of Victory Road is this? One with gears? Never seen that before. Go north through the double caves, and speaking of cave, this next location may actually seem familiar. Don't know it yet? Go to the southwest towards the center with this ball-shaped light shard. See it now? Think back. Swim on the water until you see something on the right. Is it dawning on you? That's right. This is Cerulean Cave. And that Pokemon over there? Oh, fuck. Time for another legendary battle against the cloned Psychic King Mewtwo. Level 75. Yeah, all the way down in this glitch hell is naturally another of the 6v1 hell fights. Your team, though, can be evenly leveled with it, so hopefully you have the means to topple it. In my case, starting with Vanillux whips up the hail. But Mewtwo's signature move, Psy Strike, destroys Vanillux. Well, I have one answer to that. Here's something to keep in mind. The Dark, Steel, and Fairy moves lose their types, but not the Pokémon of those types. Houndoom can easily stop Mewtwo's Psy Strike, though it's going to hit instead with Thunderbolt for a third of my health. The Uber Pokémon also has a Leftovers, because what fucking wouldn't in this hellscape? Flamethrower from Houndoom does about the same to Mewtwo, as Leftovers is cancelled by Hail. Its Ice Beam and Speed will kill Houndoom first, who brings the Psychic type to red. I send out Greninja, hoping that Priority will let me kill it, but a 3 hit with Crit isn't quite enough. Miraculously, he survives Mewtwo's Thunderbolt, letting him go once more. Even though he fails to put down the Legendary himself with the following 2 hit, and falls to Psy Strike, Vanillux is the real hero here, whose hail plinks Mewtwo and it faints. Scary situation. Mewtwo is obviously nonsensically fast and powerful, so getting anything to survive its attacks would be difficult. I brought two bug types to deal with it, but thankfully I won without them. They would have probably been powerless against it anyway. With the legendary defeated, we are suddenly transported to Lance's room in the Elite Four of Kanto. We cannot turn back now. Proceed forth with your battered team to the door, who yells at you to show the Cinder Badge. When you do so, it gladly lets you in and gives you a Light Shard. Oh, thank goodness. There is no Lance here, which means only the Champion Chamber remains. Eat the Light Shard and step through the threshold into the ultimate challenge of Red and Blue, Pokemon Champion Terra. Finally, after this long and mind-breaking trek, we finally caught up to the most unlikely Meteor Agent. Now, it might have seemed necessary before starting on this cursed expedition that you assemble the team you want to use on Terra before even beginning, and that you had to take into account the Mewtwo as well. However, this turns out not to be a problem as I had originally thought. Once you lay eyes on Terra, you can run away, as you'd probably want to. If you leave her chamber, you go back to the very first room of Glitch City and can go straight back to her after you've set up. I didn't actually know this when I went through, so I had put together my party at the very beginning. You've seen several of them already, of course, so let me go into depth on the reasons why I chose these Pokémon against the Queen of Headaches. Heading out first is Krikatoon. I'm doing this specifically for Sticky Web. Unless Terra has a Gliss score, which I bet she will, then all of Terra's ground Pokémon should be caught in it and will greatly assist any of my Pokémon with middling speed. Krikatoon resists ground, but I'm fully expecting 5 million Rock Slides and Stone Edges. Speaking of Rock Slide and Stone Edge, we have Houndoom. He's not going to like those, but Destiny Bond will. Houndoom has a pretty bad moveset since we are neck deep in the worst field. Both of his dark moves are now normal moves, so they're trash. However, I know of one of Terra's Pokémon and I know that if Houndoom can use Flamethrower first, it should take care of it. Next is Heracross. She's got some weird types for this, but Bug Fighting means she resists both Ground and Rock, and again, besides Gliscor, she should have a chance to bash a few Pokémon with Flame Orb Guts close combat. 
Now for some Pokemon that actually hit ground types super effective. Like Vanillux. Oh yeah, the Clutch Master joins the Master of Fury. And I believe Vanillux stands to benefit the most from Sticky Web. He's got Blizzard to utterly wreck Mono Ground, but if Terra thinks she'll be cute with something like a Whiskash, then Freeze Dry will shut that down. Then comes Greninja. Once again, pretty understandable. Water Shuriken lets me make sure that nothing on low HP gets to take a parting shot, and will hopefully do some pretty good damage even on full HP targets. I'll be honest though, I'm kind of getting tired of Greninja's moveset being pretty flimsy, but a lot of the best TMs in the game are still to come. One thing I really wanted to use was Surf, but I have had a hard time finding a good Pokemon to use it with. I was hoping that I could use it on my final, brand new Pokemon, but turns out it can't learn it. Frustratingly, I had to settle for Hydro Pump with Washing Machine Rotom. Oh yeah, if it's used all the time and I hate it, maybe that's because it's good. What luck, too. The same episode that the Rotom modifier became available, I decided to make use of it. Now, this is a gamble in my mind. Rotom has pros and cons. Positives include being immune to ground without being weak to rock, having a powerful move to use against ground, and washing machine being pretty bulky. Cons, though, include the fact that I didn't look at this Rotom before leaving Reborn City and then discovering this thing has a zero IV in special attack. I so hate that. Even though it's strong, it could be so much better. The other con is Hydro Pump. It's stronger than Surf, sure, but that mischance, it's going to bite me, and I will rage. This is what I've got going into the fight with the Glitch City's mayor. This could be a disgusting fight. Never mind that we have to conduct a major fight on Glitch Field to my nausea. If Terra's team itself has something that I can't work around, then we could be looking at a lot of resets. Speak now with the Clown of Ground, who begins with Lance's dialogue for some reason you were supposed to use the champion speech. She doesn't really want to do any of those dramatic speeches, but she does give you actual information about herself. Why did she join Meteor? She got bored, so she decided she wanted to cause some anarchy. That's totally believable. As childish and dumb as it is, she says Meteor does it like she wants it. Just like Fern, just like Blake, Terra's in on this all for herself, it seems. Time to kick the Chaos Champion off of her black and white, red and blue throne. Oh yeah, the OG Champion theme, all on its own. The sixth champion theme used in Reborn. A sick cap off to this off putting excursion. I have Cricketune out in front, hoping to lay the speed trap from the beginning, but Terra starts by deploying the Pokemon Speedrun King. That is, Nido King. Or as she calls him, Giovanni. I'm Giovanni. Oh no, I'm not going to outspeed that. Maybe it won't have. Flamethrower. Fuck! Where to now? I guess Greninja to throw some priority shurikens. Once again though, the multi-hit move, though it crit once, gives me more reason to replace it when I get two straight two hits with it. Leaving Needle King barely alive as it then, of course covering water, hits Greninja with two thunderbolts. I go into my fastest Pokemon Houndoom and am able to mop it up, but this is really bad already. Terra's next Pokemon will be Hippodon, the thick fuck. I put Vanillix out to slam its ice weakness, but I'm treated to an annoying quirk in automatic weather abilities. Vanillix is faster than Hippodon, which is confirmed when my hailstorm starts, then is promptly overridden by its sand stream. Though it is probably the least impactful part of the field effect, I get to benefit off of one piece of glitch field. Blizzard no longer has perfect accuracy without hail, but glitch field raises it to 90 for me. With it, I blow down the Hippopotamus. Holy shit, that's hard to say. Next out, though, is that one Pokemon I knew would be here. Exadrill. I know this because this is the first in a fucking army of Exadrills you're going to see for the rest of the game. I put Houndoom out in front of Exakill and hope he's faster. But I'm screwed on that front. It would seem that Exadrill probably has Sand Rush, so this Sandstorm lets him rock slide Houndoom to death first. Horrendous. 
I try going into Heracross since she resists rock and ground and can crush the steel typing on that mole, but Terra has other plans. She yanks the Exadrill for a Palisand, which may already make you go, Ugh! But then it does something worse, in my opinion. It pops a seed, and its types all go out the window. Well, maybe in this case it's okay, as close combat will... miss. What? Okay, try it again. It missed again! That can be blamed on Sandvale, because why keep a signature ability that nullifies one of your weaknesses? Oh wait, I'm sorry. The seed already got rid of that. This Palisand, who is named something you'll have to wait a few more episodes to understand, shoots OP Psychic and puts Heracross right into an amount of health where her own burn kills her. Tell you what, my F12 finger was itchy at that moment. Two 20% chances to miss and they both happened? I was way more prone to resets than my last file, but I stay to see this train wreck to the end. Against a weaknessless Palisand, I put in Vanillux who will get rid of this damn sandstorm and thereby Sandy's evasion chance. I hope that Blizzard does a good amount, but a third is not good, especially in the face of an amnesia. Remember, that's buffing special attack too. I use another Blizzard and it gets very close to dying anyway, but then it uses Shore Up to heal way back up. Fuck, here we go. I spend the next five turns slamming the sandcastle with blizzards, hoping for a freeze or a crit while it continues to recover with shore up. On the fourth one, I do get a crit, which for some reason seems to have barely done anything. I was certain that a crit cutting through special defense would take the thing down, but it looks like it just did a regular 50% extra. The last blizzard just in time causes a freeze, which Palisand immediately thaws from. Why does Freeze suck only for me? This entrenched sand monster is way beyond my ability to kill now, as it buffs up more and eventually takes down my Vanillux and Rotom. Well, it would have been nice if Sticky Web were sitting on Terra's side the whole time. I know, though, that, unless I want to use a Focus Sash, Krikatoon doesn't have a prayer against Nidoking, so I switch him with Greninja and wait for the Hippo to come back out to place the trap then. Round 2 with the Clown starts amazingly better. Water Shuriken looks to win my favor again by delivering a 4 hit with 2 crits, which is enough to defeat the Needle King from full HP. Though as I think about it, a Greninja is probably faster than Needle King, and a Surf would be still higher power. As I continue to wrestle with the cost-benefit analysis of 2 Pokemon moves, a Hippo begins charging at me. Perfect. That slow fuck will give Krikatoon the chance to put down Sticky Web. Indeed, Fury itself manages to use the hazard, However, he's not ready to leave yet. The Hippodon Stone Edge misses. Krikatoon chops it with an X Scissor for good damage, and then Stone Edge misses again. You should have known better than to disrespect the Master of Fury. Another X Scissor upon you! Hip Hop lands the third Stone Edge though, and Krikatoon is finished. Now the fight will take a much better course. With Sandstorm already active, Vanillux can come in with a cold front. An unmissable Blizzard takes the Hippo down easily. Now we've got Sticky Web online and an Exadrill burrowing back in. Houndoom meets it again. Will he be faster than it now? Yes! One flamethrower melts the metal claws off the mole. But then we have, undoubtedly, Terra's Ace. And now we have to find out how much we have gotten better against A. Level 75 Garchomp. My Vanillux is even level with it and it loses a speed stage, but Garchomp goes first with Stone Edge. Have you still not learned? Vanillux is the Clutch Master. It goes without saying, but that Stone Edge missing right then was monumental. The Pokemon who hates ice the most is obliterated by Vanillux's Blizzard, and we could have a chance here. Better still, Terra reveals her last Pokemon, Quagsire. Yes, time for Freeze Dry to do nothing different! Fucking glitch field! Quagsire, like the Palisand, also had a synthetic seed, letting him remove his types. I still went for Freeze Dry because I remembered a weird rule, but it was not for this field. It was for... a different one. But then I get a sense of deja vu. Swagsire here, uses Amnesia. Fuck, not you too! 
I'm hoping the extra power from Blizzard makes up the difference from using Freeze Dry last turn, but Quag barely lives and does another familiar tactic. It uses Recover. I use another Blizzard with the hope that I can damage range it away, but it is slowly gaining HP over my damage. But then... I just remembered! It actually happened! I used Taunt at the right time! The Taunt invalidates Quagsire's upcoming turn, trying to use Recover again. Now we've got it. I hit it with Blizzard again, as it is forced to use Scald against me for only 20% damage. However, for the second time, I'm forced to rely on Blizzard's regular accuracy after the hail stops. And for the second time, I can argue that Glitchfield actually helped me. Gen 1's Blizzard accuracy gives me a kill against Swagsire. This leaves one last Sandy Pokemon to defeat, and now I know how to do it right. Palisand comes out, and Vanillux immediately uses Taunt, blocking the Sandcastle's first turn. 90% Blizzard lands again for a third as Palisand uses Psychic on me. Infuriatingly, it gets a crit, putting me in a bad spot. I'm not sure Vanillix can survive another, as he then blasts the Palisand with another successful Blizzard, his last one. And then Vanillix lives! He goes for the Freeze Dry to kill?! What the fuck?! Damn healing items! It may be okay though. Taunt just wore off, so Vanillix's last act is to taunt one last time. However, Palisand did not try to buff, instead opting to kill off Vanillix. Amazing effort. I send out Heracross in a hope that she can topple the Sandcastle quickly. What's frustrating is that Sandy is already up one stage of defense. Unfortunately, close combat only takes away half of its remaining HP, as it uses a Psychic that is still able to kill Heracross from full health even without a buff. I send out Houndoom and hope that he can end it with Destiny Bond, but discover that Sandy is very poor against him. I just have to get this done now. Oh, just as the taunt wore off, Houndoom glassed Palisand, and Terra apparently forgot to use her second Ultra Potion. This has been an episode of two attempt fights, where the first one mostly went horrible, then the second one gave me a decisive win. Terra has a scary lineup, who all make terrifying use of Sandstorm. Not only that, their speed was definitely an issue, especially if we hadn't lucked our way through the Garchomp. Meanwhile, Glitchfield is probably the most tame here as it will ever be. This was a rare time I could prepare for it, but take something like Meowstic for example. Her Shadow Ball would have been useless here since it uses her garbage attack stat. That's the fear I have towards Glitchfield in the future, when I will have no choice but to endure problems like that. Terra overall wasn't and isn't the worst gym leader to defeat. However, my last file once again was named to remind me about something the last time I fought her. It was named Terra when Stone Edge misses twice. That is probably in reference to the Garchomp, and I can assure you the pseudo-legendary probably destroyed me on a ton of attempts with this team. Vanillix and Heracross yet again with some of the Pokemon you've commonly seen in these screenshots. Blastoise, Dusclops, Meowstic, and Toxapex. Dustclops, though, should teach a lesson in not over-relying on Trick Room, because it's not like all of Terra's team was ultra-fast. After all the hostility, you'd think that Terra would just fly away or try to flatten us with her mallet again, but no, she respects the Reborn League, and confers to us the Gravity Badge. The second of our Agate Ace Triumvirate badges, it apparently also doesn't raise our level cap, but does activate a Water HM, Waterfall. Terra also throws a TM at my head, the TM for Bulldoze. Terra ends her speech with one final incoherent babbling, then promptly dashes through the doors, sealing herself in. With just two screens transitions to the south, we are back in reality. Ciel gives us a round of applause, as Samson says that Terra just seemed to be trying to distract us with this entire chase. He says he can't find her in the computer anywhere, but hatches a great idea. He unplugs the computer. Uh, did you just kill Terra? Pretty metal way to do it. Samson isn't sure he did or not, but
but is pretty sure she can't get out of there while it's off. We have no lead on Agate now, but that doesn't matter to us for the moment. We have what it takes to scale the waterfall where Titania and Amaria fell. A waterfall which I stood at the top of, unable to advance any further in my very first playthrough. This was the last major battle of Reborn's Episode 14 release, and ideas of what lie below bounced through my head. For me, it would be two years before I found out. It turns out that what we do down there will have the most weight of anything we've done to this point. But if you want to talk about weight, then you'll find it in the pit of your stomach at what's about to happen next.